Well, welcome to Music Off the Record. All right, North of Sinfonietta at Pierce College. We're excited. Our next concert is Mozart and Beethoven. So we'll talk a little bit about the music that's on that. Uh, David Lockington is one of our new associate, um, or artistic partners, I mean, and so that's exciting. We'll see what, uh, what he brings to the orchestra. Uh, concert is titled Mozart and Beethoven. Um, although, you know, the only, th only complaint I ever have is that that title seems a little bit dry, so I've come up with something a little more creative. What do you think? Mozart and Beethoven bad boys of the 18th and 19th century. We'll talk about why I think this title might work, but the problem is they're not the only composers on the program. We also have Copeland, so we might have to throw Copeland in there. What do you think? Copeland work as a bad boy? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Slightly different glasses style. I don't know. So let's talk about him first. Aaron Copeland is one of our composers. Uh, first thing that we'll start off with. American composer, a very iconic. Uh, how many of you have heard of Copeland before? From there's Copeland? Absolutely, yeah. All of you, great. Um, so Copeland starts out as a young composer, um, and he's doing what is the thing to do at the beginning of the 20th century, which is writing atonal music. He writes some piano variations that immediately get a lot of attention amongst other composers. Uh, he's, you know, recognizes this genius with atonal music. He heads over to Europe, studies with, uh, in Paris with a woman named Nadia Boulanger, who is the foremost composition teacher at the time. Uh, right after he returns here to the United States, he's having a bit of a change of mind with this whole atonal, dissonant 20th century music, and he decides um, that art should serve the people, that general people should like. And so he's, he's turning around and starting to do some tonal music, which other composers are looking down on to begin with, going, oh, scoff, tonal music. Well, right about this time that he arrives back in the States, he gets a commission from the Boston Symphony Orchestra, from Kusevitsky, to write something for them. And so he writes a piece that not only is tonal, oh, 20th century music, that's tonal scoff, but he actually incorporates jazz because he's looking to create an American music. He says, all right, if I want to make it sound American and not like everything European we've had before, what do I do? Well, let me throw some jazz in there because jazz is a very American thing. And for the audience, for the, the Boston Symphony Orchestra, um, jazz is like popular music of the time. And so that's definitely not uppity enough for some of them to be, to be the Boston Symphony Orchestra jazz. Oh. And so there's actually quite a few critics uh, that don't like it at first. So as far as how Copeland fits into my title of Bad Boys of Music, he calls it music for theater, but it's a lie. There's absolutely no theater involved. Absolutely none. Um, so that's what I was talking about up there with the commission. Uh, when he was commissioned for it, uh, Copeland said, I think I'll write a series of pieces to be called incidental music for an imaginary drama. And that, of course, gets changed to music for theater. But there's no play. There's no story. It's just music that maybe could be used for a theater production sometime if we wanted to. <laughs> uh, it has five movements, which kind of look like they might uh, go along with a play. Um, you know, a prologue that would go before the play, a dance some point during the play, uh, an interlude for a scene change, a burlesque for you know, some other dance during the, the play, and then some postlude, as it were, the epilogue. So those are the movements, although there's no play going on. So as far as what our sound is like, um, like we said, it incorporates that, that jazz, which got him some major critics at first from the audience of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, although not long after it became his most popular piece until the ballets that everybody knows now. It was, this was before those were written, so this became his most popular piece. But let's see if we can hear some of that uh, jazz influence in there. Give me just a second and I'll get that up. We'll listen to the first movement, which starts off with this drum roll and then has a real jazzy kind of trumpet get started. While we're waiting for that to think, then we'll hear a little bit of the second movement. Uh, here we go. All right. Skip 
to the second movement, our dance. a little taste of that. So we'll, we'll start off with that piece. Uh, that, again, kind of launched Copeland a little bit once he got back in the United States. That was a really popular piece for a while for our orchestras, and then he got writing those ballets, which, of course, uh, really launched, launched him onto the international scene and did a lot. Questions about Copeland? Or... Oh, you would ask that, wouldn't you? I think 1930-something? We'll have to... Uh, Double check that and find out. Neil's looking it up, he'll tell you. Our fearless leader here. All right, so back to our Mozart and Beethoven, and why would, why would anyone ever call them bad boys of music? I do like the sunglasses though, don't you think? I think we should put David Lockington in a pair of sunglasses for the concert. I don't know if he'll go for it or not. But. <laughs> All right, so this is why I'm saying that, suggesting that title. Good composers do certain things, especially for Mozart. So let's start off talking about Mozart. Good composers do this. Uh, first of all, you get a good job. There's three places you can get a job. At the Opera House, in the Royal Court, composing for His Royal Highness, um, or at the church. It's what you do. Uh, and then you write music in sonata form. It's what you do in this time period. And it's a certain structure. We'll talk a little bit about that structure. But if you're a good composer, you write in the sonata form, and you... Uh, get one of the jobs at one of these three places. And of course, you use the standard sized orchestra too with strings and winds and pairs. So this is what good composers do. Neil, did you find that date? 1925. 25, I was close. <laughs> 1925. All right, <clears throat> so Mozart, first of all, doesn't get a good job, much to his father's dismay. He, uh, he has, starts off after his whole child prodigy that everybody's familiar with, Mozart, the child prodigy. Once he grows up and he's no longer anything special, he gets a job in the royal court, like a good composer, playing second fiddle to his dad. Uh, he can't stand that. Uh, and so he, uh, he takes off and leaves. Do you remember, oh, I was gonna get this in there, but I didn't throw it in there, the movie Amadeus, where they go to Vienna and uh, he wants to leave and no longer work for the archbishop. It's a little dramatized in that movie, of course, but that much is, the concept is true, that he did not want to stay in Salzburg where he was working, he didn't want to stay there. He wanted to go to Vienna and be a freelance composer. Now this concept of a freelance composer was unheard of. People just didn't do that. <clears throat> but he does, he heads to Vienna, starts putting in concerts, he runs into a few problems. Um, so there are certain venues, concert halls like this one where concerts are put on, but it's not like you can just rent one easily. They're under pretty tight control by the people who own them. The people who put these concerts on are called impresarios. And there's a couple of times a year that they might let a composer rent out the hall and put on a concert to, to you know, make some money. But only a couple times a year. And there's only a couple of these venues available. <clears throat> so the impresarios, as they call them, they're the ones making the real money. This is the CEO of the concert hall, I guess. They're, they're, they're making the real money. So Mozart says, well, then why don't I start putting on the concerts myself. He, he uh, develops some business savvy. He starts putting on his own concerts and trying out some different venues. He's playing in uh, um, uh, theaters that aren't usually concert halls and cafes and things, other places that he can find. And he's lining up several of these throughout the season and, and getting people to subscribe to ticket sales. So he's putting on his own subscription uh, concerts, performing his music. 
And he's trying to draw as big an audience as possible, of course. And what he finds is the biggest draw for, for his audiences is the piano concerto, him playing piano concertos. So of his 21 or so piano concertos, actually there's more than that, anyway, of his piano concertos, a big chunk of them were written for these subscription concerts because that's what kept bringing the audiences in. Uh, but since they kept coming, you know, subscribing over and over again, he felt like if he just kept doing the same thing, doing it in the box like a good little composer, that they're gonna get bored with that. So he was always looking for ways to have things be a little bit novel, a little bit unexpected for our audience. Um, to, uh, to keep them interested, to keep them coming. So a few things about our particular piano concerto that we're looking at that are unusual. One is that it's in a minor key. Uh, minor keys aren't a big deal today, but they were not very common then, and especially in the music of Mozart. Uh, for example, um, he only had two symphonies out of his 41 that were in minor, and out of his 27 concerti, only two of them were minor. His audience called this the demonic concerto. So there's our Mozart demon up there. <laughs> perhaps because it was minor, perhaps because of the ways that they felt it sounded, but they, they referred to this as his demonic concerto. Um, so it's in a minor key, that's unusual, but it is in the sonata form. Remember, that's one of the good things a good little composer is supposed to do, is write in sonata form. So we have to learn a little bit of sonata form to know what our audience is expecting. It has three big parts, the exposition, development, and recapitulation. We're really only gonna worry about that first part, the exposition and what happens in there, or I should say, what's supposed to happen in there, and what Mozart does. So, in our demonic concerto, we have uh, our sonata form, our exposition, so we're talking about that first chunk. Now I'm gonna to try to use some familiar tunes, silly though it may seem, to kind of help us understand what this exposition is supposed to go like. So exposition has a couple of main themes and then some kind of closing up material. So we're gonna use some familiar tunes like uh, I've been working on the railroad is gonna be our first theme. Twinkle, twinkle, little star is gonna be our second theme. So the orchestra would start out with. Of course, it would go on for a little bit longer. Then there would be kind of a transition that would go. Into our second theme. And our second theme, which was typically more lyrical. Back then, they called it the feminine theme. Very politically incorrect today. Of course, today's we call it the lyrical theme, but it was typically softer, more lyrical. We'd have that second theme. And then we might have some, just kind of wrapping it up material. So that's what, if this were a, a symphony, that would be the whole exposition, and then they would repeat it. And then we would move on to that next big chunk, the development. Um, or a sonata, like a piano sonata, whatever. Concerto is a little bit different. It's special because we have the soloist versus the orchestra concept. So in a concerto, the orchestra does that all by themselves first. Like if you've ever been to a concerto, you're excited to see the soloist and you're wondering how come it's so long before they start to play. It's because the orchestra has their turn during the whole exposition first. Then it's the soloist's turn with the exposition. The orchestra, of course, still plays, uh, but it's gonna play much more of a backup role to the soloist. And it's supposed to play the same theme. So we should now have our pianist going. might have a slightly different transition and then play this in a different place, but it's still gonna have the same second theme. And then it's also gonna have some closing up sort of material. So this is what we're supposed to have, right? We're gonna recognize our first theme and our second theme, our lyrical pretty theme, wrapping up material. Here comes the piano to play the same stuff, uh, but showing off the piano. Maybe it's slightly different to show off the piano. Well, let's see what Mozart does and uh, what we can get. So here is, if you read music, great. If not, don't worry about it. Our first theme there.
So, if Mozart were a good little composer, then after the, piano, the orchestra's done with their second theme and they're wrapping it up stuff, we should get the piano playing something like the... Right, that same thing with the, the pulsating syncopated chords and that rumbling bass down there, that's what we should get. But do we get that is the question. Let's listen and see. So he throws in a second, second theme, right? He fools us into thinking all is right again. I'm going to be a good little composer and write the same theme we had in the orchestra exposition. And then it gets done. And he comes up with a whole other second theme. Or though, are we on a fourth theme by now? What are? And this is one of the amazing things about Mozart. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to write music before. But coming up with new melodic material is challenging. Go ahead and try it. What most likely will happen is you try to come up with a new tune is you'll, write some, you'll come up with something and think, oh, I've done it. And then you'll recognize what you've just written as something you've heard before, <laughs> as challenging. And it's challenging for composers, too. So we see a lot of other composers that once they get a theme, they use that thing. And you know, Haydn is going to reuse it to every last little bit, make sure to get all their use out of it, because new themes are difficult to come by. Uh, you meet composers doing things like monothematic transformation. <laughs> I have one theme, and I'm just going to change it a lot. But Mozart seemed to just have melodies just oozing out of him. They just came out everywhere. So he's going to throw a new theme here. Sure, we've already had three themes, but let's throw another one in here, another second theme for our piano once it's done with the first second theme. So all these things are going to be unexpected things, little things to give his audience a thrill, because again, they all knew very well exactly what to expect, and Mozart knows what they're expecting. And so he's really playing with those expectations, which is part of what's so fun uh, about this concerto if you know the expectations. So that's the first movement, my, my favorite movement, my favorite concerto. On to our second movement. Second movement is really kind of uh, interesting. It starts off uh, very slowly, uh, very lyrical, and it's very sparse for the piano. 
Um, I remember my bachelor's degree is in piano performance, and I remember one of the piano professors where I studied talking about she was playing a piano concerto with the local symphony orchestra. This was the Utah Symphony Orchestra she was playing with, and uh, her teenage daughter wanted to bring some friends to go see. She said, but uh, can you play something hard? Not one of those Mozart concertos. <laughs> it just didn't sound hard enough to be showy enough for her friends, uh, because that's not what Mozart was about, was just showing off, and especially these second, um, second movements. Let me get this started. And uh, if you can see the music up there, again, even if you don't read music, you'll notice how sparse it is. There's not a lot up there for the, the piano to be playing. charming melody, the beautiful simplicity that is Mozart. Um, and there's times when I, you know, I was playing this, like I said, I love this concerto, so I was playing through it for some fun at home and got to the spot that's, that's up here with this sort of thing. My wife says, but there's more than that, right? <laughs> Are you just, just working on the right hand? <laughs> That's all there is. Now there's orchestra pulsing at the same time, but it's very, very bare. There's nothing but that melody up there. One note at a time, definitely not something for my piano professor to show off for her daughter's uh, friends with there. But what's so interesting about it is there's a page turn uh, in my music as I'm going through it that suddenly I go, wait a minute, did I skip a page here? Because it so abruptly goes from this really, really sparse to, to, and, and in major, we're in this B flat major, right? To shifting back into much more of a minor sound and suddenly a lot more notes going on at once with things like this. Wait a minute, did I miss a page? You know, because it's so abrupt, the switch. And he says, okay, we've had enough of the pretty stuff. Let's throw something more demonic back at you. So let's see if we can hear some of that, the, the real version, rather than my plunking. Let me see if I can find it. for a while, he'll go back to the nice, you know, pretty B-flat major stuff that he started with. Oh, here's that, if you wanted to see the, the music when it changes. We go from that sparse, almost no notes, to suddenly there's a lot more notes on the page. Abrupt shift into that. Uh, and then a note at the bottom there says it going back to this A, B, A form, because it goes back to the beginning sort of sound and wraps it up that way. Nice little symmetrical form, which is expected, the symmetrical form anyway. All right, the last movement of the concerto is in kind of in a rondo form, and that's what we expect. Uh, we expect this rondo form, which means we're going to have some musical material, we'll have something else, something contrasting, and then we'll come back to that first stuff, and then we'll have something contrasting, and we're going to come back 
to that first stuff again. So that first theme we hear, we're going to expect to keep hearing that uh, coming back um, over and over again. That first theme has this real kind of shooting right up sort of a theme, an arpeggio, if you will. Let me play it for you. concert, you'll hear that, you'll hear a contrasting section, you'll hear that come back. A little fun note about this one is that the day of this concert, one of these subscription concerts that Mozart's putting it on, so the only person to give Mozart the composer the deadline is Mozart, the impresario, who's the head of the project, right? This is a problem. <laughs> no one else to hold the deadline over his head. So the day of the concert, they're having a little rehearsal before the concert starts, Mozart shows up writing the last movement to this thing. And so the, uh, they never rehearsed it before the first performance, not once, because he was copying out the parts. Oh, I gotta copy the parts for the violin. Everybody, instead of practicing, was helping copy out parts from his score for the orchestra. And then it was time for the concert to start. So they never ran through it, not a single time before the first performance. He'd never played the piece that he'd written <laughs> because he was writing it as he was showing up. <laughs> but yet it went uh, apparently very well. His, there's a letter um, from Mozart's father to his sister about this concert. It was in the winter time. It seems like it was December, January sometime that it was premiered. And so uh, Mozart's father goes on about the difficult journey from Salzburg into Vienna, the carriage, and you know, going through all the snow and how hard it was. But then they got there and the concert you know, um, went really well. Haydn was there in attendance, the composer Haydn. And it was after this concert um, that Haydn came up to Mozart's father and said that Mozart was uh, the most talented musician composer that Haydn had ever seen, heard, or met, sort of thing. So apparently it still went well because Haydn was quite impressed. So that's it for our Mozart concerto. Any questions about the Mozart piano concerto number 20? He didn't call it number 20, he just called it piano concerto in D minor, it was later numbered, number 20. My favorite of all the Mozart piano concertos, definitely worth seeing, I'm excited for it. All right, that brings us to our last piece, the Beethoven Eighth Symphony. Um, now Beethoven's really kind of interesting how his symphonies, he seems to do different things with his odd numbered and his even numbered symphonies. Um, by the Eighth Symphony, but Beethoven's audience knows Beethoven, and they're expecting the bad boy, as it were, they're expecting him to break rules. He also refused to take a job as a court composer. Instead, he said, no, I'm gonna write music because I want to write music, and the royalty should just give me money anyway. And they did. I don't know how he made that work. <laughs> you know, Mozart was gonna be a freelance composer, but he'd say, you know, pay me and I'll write a piece of music for you. What would you like? Uh, I want an opera about this. Okay, all right, you know, I want, a, I want a symphony, I want it to sound like this. Okay, I'll do that. Beethoven says, I'm gonna write what I'd like, and it's gonna sound like how I, think it should be, and you should give me money. And they did. Uh, and so somehow he made that work. <laughs> and by now they, they're expecting something big and bold and, and pushing the envelope and, and bending rules from Beethoven. His third symphony was the first one that really kind of exploded our, our expectations of the symphony. It was way longer than the symphony. It was still in that sonata form, but it was really pushing it. It was really stretching some of the limits of that expected form. Uh, but the fourth symphony, he calmed back down again and did a more typical symphony. Then the fifth symphony, of course, the famous fifth symphony, same thing, too long, adding instruments to the orchestra. It's neither the right size of orchestra or the right length. It's breaking all kinds of rules. Sixth symphony calms back down again and writes a, a little bit more typical symphony. Um, seventh symphony, big and long. Eighth symphony, seventh and eighth symphonies were premiered next to each other, same concert, right together. And so the seventh symphony was a little more what they were expecting, a longer, bigger, bolder sort of symphony. And this eighth one was quite small. Beethoven himself referred to it as his small symphony um, in the, this particular key. So um, he was actually asked at 
the concert where it was premiered alongside the seventh, why was it so much smaller? And his response was, because it's so much better. <laughs> That's why it's so much smaller, because it's better. Um, which I, I think probably left them still scratching their heads. But um, part of what I think is he's really, he takes these, these ideas where he, he breaks open, not necessarily completely breaks, but really bending the rules. He does these great big bold things. And then he says, let me see if I can do the same thing uh, inside the box. You know, I'm gonna think outside the box, and now let me see if I can do it with restraints on myself. At the same time, this, this has a lot of these kind of delicate shadings and, and subtle nuances that, that you don't get in the big bombastic symphonies that he writes. Uh, Charles Rosen, who's a, who's a noted um, musician and scholar on music, uh, refers to the Saint Symphony as a last nod to the civilized gaiety of the classical period. This is Beethoven's last tip of the hat to the white wig wearing, you know, pinky out while you're sipping tea sort of crowd uh, as we're really kind of moving out of that. Because, you know, we're talking at the same time as the French Revolution's going on and stuff like this. So the royalty are having a struggle and a rise of the middle class is happening. And so this is kind of Beethoven's last hurrah for the sound that the aristocracy really liked um, before moving away from that. Um, but, and same thing, a lot of these kind of innovations and the ways that he was stretching the form in the earlier symphonies, he does, he does in the Eighth Symphony, but he just does it in a smaller package. Perhaps a little bit of the less is more concept uh, we see from him. And a lot of his music after this starts to get smaller and smaller in a lot of ways. So here's our expected sonata form. So again, we're going with what Beethoven's audience expected. Notice the proportions. That exposition part is bigger, the development is smaller, and the recapitulation is bigger, and this coda uh, which literally just means tail in Italian, it's just a few wrapping it up sort of chords. It's very short. A Mozart symphony, that coda could last 15 to 20 seconds. It's quite short. And it's essentially just this kind of a, you know, um, that's it. That's what codas are supposed to be, right? That's what codas are. They're just wrapping it up sort of music for a good little composer. And our development is really an interesting part where we get a lot of uh, the, you know, the composers are really exercising their musical muscle in their brain. And that's where we have bits and pieces of the music that we got in the exposition and we're gonna transpose them up and move them down, get fragments of them, and it's really interesting stuff. But it's short, it's really complicated stuff. So we, don't, we keep it short and we cushion it with the exposition with our three themes like we learned in the concerto and the recapitulation at the end. Well. Uh, Beethoven's Eighth Symphony, that first movement where we have the sonata form, um, he really keeps that exposition concise. It's the same length as a Mozart first movement of a symphony, so it's not that unusual there. Uh, our themes are fairly short, um, and we have a really short bridge. The bridge is kind of the transition from the first theme to the second theme, um, and Beethoven in the Fifth Symphony as well, does these really, really short key changes where other people tend to take a lot longer. Uh, but let's just listen to some of it, see if we hear some of these short transitions. second theme.
in a second. So as far as looking at the whole thing, <clears throat> um, he still has what he created in some of his other symphonies in that this is more what his sonata form looks like. Notice that middle development part is stretched out big and the other parts are small. So he, he makes the, his themes short enough to compensate so that instead of having a massive symphony like the fifth symphony or the third symphony, it's still regular size, but the proportions are different. So we get the development with all the moving around and the complexity, uh, that's the bigger part and our exposition development are a little bit shorter. And then the coda is too big too. And it's not just wrapping it up chords. First we have up and down, that, that looks like the development. He starts treating the coda like a whole nother development, which is what he did in the fifth symphony and in the third symphony and other things too. So we have all the same kind of stuff, it's just that it's a little bit smaller. Um, than before. <clears throat> Other things that you, you'll hear in there, uh, these big gaps of silence, um, or very little going on between things, which takes a lot of composer, composure, you know, that to, to allow that to sit there and ring. Um, and then something that is called hemiola, which just means you feel like it's in one meter and suddenly it feels like it's in the wrong meter. Let's see if we can find one of those for you, what I'm talking about. Second movement um, is a little bit more what we expect. Again, we're thinking this is that last nod to the aristocracy. One of the things that was a big deal then was the art of civilized conversation. You know, the, the students that I sometimes see in the hallways here at Pierce College where they're standing in a circle and not talking to each other. They all have their phones out just texting instead and they never actually talk to each other. This would have been just, just absolutely unheard of. That's what you know, the big point of upper society was, is to get together while sipping your tea with your pinky out and have these delightful conversations. The art of conversation was very important and very valuable. And Beethoven kind of creates that. We have this, uh, again, even if you can't read music, you can kind of see how the, the higher parts, they're playing some little themes, and then it's the lower parts, they kind of answer. We get this real back and forth, question and answer, a little conversation going on between uh, the upper strings and the lower strings. We'll just listen to a tiny bit of that. sound like chattering proper society? Da, 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 da. All this little, you know, chitter chattering sort of thing. And so that's kind of the second movement. It's very light uh, as they would have liked. Also interesting because he, he goes back to, again, the typical symphony. The third movement had always been a minuet. A minuet was a royal dance. Um, and in a lot of his symphonies, he stopped. Fifth symphony, he did not write a minuet. He called it a scherzo instead. It was way too fast to be that kind of dance. So it was different. He was kind of doing away with that aristocratic sort of um, part of the symphony. But he brings it back here, he actually puts right in the music, Temple of a Minuet. The seventh symphony that was performed along with it, no such thing. On the third movement, he marked it Presto, which is really fast. None of this, you know, delicate dancing of the royals. It was just uh, fast. This one, he goes back to this uh, minuet. It has a very typical structure, minuet, and then a second part called a trio all that kind of thing. In the trio, there's this kind of hunting horn sound, because you know.
normal people think hunting is like, but it's what royals think hunting is like, right? <laughs> a charming day out in the country hunting. The fourth movement is kind of fun uh, because the tradition, again, we're talking about what audiences expected, was to have this big bang at the beginning of the fourth movement. Start it loud. It's the grand finale, right? Start a big, big bang. Uh, and instead, he, uh, he starts it really soft. He gives us the big bang, he just is gonna make us wait for it. It's almost like a backwards echo. We get this little thing going and then boom, we get the same thing repeated, but the loud version. <clears throat> and then there's the question as to what form is it? Is it sonata form or is it that rondo form? Remember the rondo form had the A, B, A? Well, let's listen and see what we think. While I was fiddling around trying to get the slide to go to the right place, we had that gap of silence. And then, just play a few notes. He's kind of teasing us and waiting. To, is it going to come back to the A, or am I going to move on to the development section? Which one is it? Is it in sonata form, or is it in rondo form, or some kind of combination of the two? And so there's Beethoven poking it fun at us a little bit, having a little fun. I don't think he really looked like that, but it's kind of a fun <laughs> image to have up there. So that's kind of our fourth movement. Uh, rounds out with the Big Bang, uh, after all. And that's what I have for you this evening. Any questions for me? Beethoven or anything else? If I can't answer it, I'll make Neil answer it for us. <laughs> all right, letting me off easy. Well, uh, if you have questions, my email is up there. You're certainly welcome to shoot me an email, and I can try to get back to you. Um, concert with the Northwest Sinfonietta is in a couple of weeks, so not this weekend, but the following. Um, should be some wonderful music to hear and experience. Thank you so much for coming.